unseen, and now uncovered. Get ready for another peek at rejected NHL logo and jersey designs. When a team sets out to adopt new branding, the first idea is rarely the final one. That often means concepts are abundant, yet abandoned, lost to history. But sometimes a forgotten past is rediscovered, giving us the chance to consider the road not taken. Join me for one more look at hockey brands that never made the cut. The epic trilogy concludes right now as Aesthetics presents NHL Prototypes, gone but not forgotten. Before we dive in, I have a quick ask. Making these videos takes a great deal of time and energy. If you've been enjoying them, your support would really go a long way to ensure I can keep them coming. YouTube recently added the super thanks button to my channel. You can click it to make a small donation, or if you prefer PayPal, you could find me there as well. I love creating content for this community, but the costs do add up after a while, so your help would be hugely appreciated. Plus, donors will be recognized in future videos. Thanks for your time. Now, on to the prototypes. My last prototypes video focused on designs that came out of that wild decade known as the 1990s. That era saw teams dive deeper into their brands than ever before. Even clubs that seldom altered their logo or uniforms over the years were looking to spice things up. Take the New York Rangers. Through nearly a century in the NHL, their look hasn't really changed. But in the mid-90s, when teams started adding third jerseys, they joined the fray. Introducing this design based on an icon of New York, the Statue of Liberty. We all know it well, but have you ever seen the concepts it beat out? In January 2021, Joe D'Alessio wrote about a surprising discovery he made. When I was a kid in you know elementary school, I would sometimes record Ranger games. But one of the games I happened to record was the night that they first wore the third jerseys in 1997. They had this whole segment on the pregame show that showed you know not just the unveiling of the jersey, but the other designs that were sort of presented to the Rangers that were um, ultimately not used. The segment turned out to be a treasure trove of rejected Rangers concepts. Can you imagine the Broadway blue shirts in red? Looking back, you know, if you look at some of the other jerseys that were unveiled around that time, they were, you know, much more sort of outside the box, much sort of bolder, much more, you know, just sort of insane jerseys with weird color schemes and, you know, one color fading to another and oversized logos or, you know, just really kind of wild designs. And the Rangers one was sort of not that. It was kind of understated compared to the other ones. It was a little bit sort of modern and, and sort of futuristic, but it was, it was just enough that it didn't, at the time, seem embarrassing in some of the ways that I think some of the other ones did. At the same time the Rangers considered third jersey options, a new team was coming to life on the other side of the country. April 1996, the Phoenix Coyotes reveal their name and logo. And although that one-of-a-kind Kachina brand was abandoned after only a few years, it did finally make a comeback in 2021. The original artwork was drawn up by local designer Greg Fisher. In an interview with the Coyotes' website in 2020, he explained the design process actually began two years before the team's arrival. His design firm was hired in 1994 by another group trying to bring hockey to the desert. These were some of the many concepts that were considered at the time. When the Winnipeg Jets moved south in 1996, the work was resurrected. At the time, much was made of the Kachina design, which bucked the 90s trend of angry cartoon animals, but that doesn't mean an angry cartoon animal was never on the table. A Minnesota firm called Valentine Design pitched this concept for the team. The league wisely rejected it. The stakes are always high when a new team is being established. And the first make or break test is finding the right name. Some owners simply go with their gut. Others hire high priced agencies. And then there's always the classic name the team contest. Abe Poland was awarded an NHL franchise for the D.C. area, starting play in 1974. To find a name, he turned to his future fan base. Writing for Weta's local history blog, Boundary Stones, in 2018, writer Shauna Lee recounted the process. Under the headline, the Washington Capitals could have been named the Washington Pandas. A Name the Team contest run by the Washington Post saw more than 11,000 votes in just two weeks. You may be surprised to hear the frontrunner was not the Capitals. 
In fact, that name didn't even crack the top five. The number one choice of DC area hockey fans in 1974? The Washington Comets. But Poland thought that name was too similar to the household cleaning brand. Second on the list was the Washington Pandas, spurred by a pair of lovable lumps that had recently arrived at the National Zoo. The names tied for third in the voting were Eagles and Metros. But Poland had a different idea. At the 11th hour, he abandoned the polling and named his team the Washington Capitals. Time for a fun fact. 88 people sent in Capitals as their name suggestion, and one of them was drawn at random to win season tickets for the inaugural year. The winner was a woman from Alexandria, Virginia, who admitted Capitals was in fact not her suggestion. She thought the team should be called the Washington Caps. She said it would be easier to put on the jerseys. I wonder if she was still around to see this stadium series uniform in 2018. Once you settle on the name, the next equally big step is designing the logo. These days, a logo reveal is a carefully orchestrated event. But 40 years ago, it was a little less precise. In 1982, John McMullen bought the Colorado Rockies and moved them to New Jersey, where they became the Devils. The product of another Name the Team contest, by the way. Only this time, the top voted name was actually used. On the day McMullen announced the name, he stood beside this unfinished rendering of the Devils logo. In the final version, as we know, the N and J were merged into a single form. It's rare these days to get a peek at unused logo designs, but on occasion, they do slip out. Here we can see a handful of ideas proposed for the Vegas Golden Knights, mostly variations of the helmet we know today. There was also this logo, reminiscent of the team's secondary mark, but with the sword wedged between the familiar red rocks of the Nevada desert. One way the Knights uniform design stood out when it debuted, white gloves to go with their white road jerseys. But experimentation in glove design started long before that. When the Florida Panthers revealed their logo and uniforms in 1993, there was a unique touch that never made it to the ice. Gloves with claws. It's been more than a decade since Atlanta lost its second NHL franchise to Canada, but that doesn't mean the Thrashers are through giving up their secrets. These days, local hockey fans get their fix from the ECHL's Atlanta Gladiators. And in 2019, the team celebrated Hockey Heritage Night, a salute to all the clubs that came before them. As part of the event, a special display featured these four concept logos for the Thrashers. The 90s were really an unmatched era for design, weren't they? When the Thrashers moved to Winnipeg in 2011, things happened quickly, with very little time to set up a new brand. But they did just that. It's now my pleasure to introduce our Executive Vice President and General Manager, Mr. Kevin Dayoff, who will make our first pick on behalf of the Winnipeg Jets. It wasn't hard to see why the new owners wanted to revive the Jets' name in Winnipeg, but there at least needed to be a new logo. In a video produced by the team recounting the creation of the Jets, we got a brief glimpse at some of the unused design work. Blink and you miss it. So here's a closer look at what was shown there. It looks like they spent a lot of time trying to merge an aircraft with the letter W. But in the end, a red maple leaf and a compass pointed north were all the embellishments the Jet needed. It was a similar story in Ottawa 20 years earlier. Owner Bruce Firestone had only one name in mind as he pushed to bring back the Senators. When the campaign kicked off in 1989, this logo was seen across the city. The T's of Ottawa came together to form the silhouette of the Peace Tower, with a Canadian flag waving at the top. It even looked like these would be the jerseys at one point, until the NHL pushed the club to come up with a better crest. In May 1991, the Roman centurion leaked to a local paper, and the backlash was strong. Decades later, it's the only logo fans want to see on a senator's jersey anymore. Funny what a little time can do. In December 1997, the centurion got a facelift for a new third jersey. It was such a hit that it became the team's primary road sweater within two years. And when the Reebok Edge jerseys were introduced in 2007, it nearly made the transition as we can see from this prototype. 
Instead, yet another version of the Centurion was introduced, and Ottawa fans rebelled for years. Finally, in 2018, the team began exploring another rebrand, and a leaked fan survey included a question about logo preferences. It showed some familiar logos, along with a few new designs under consideration. Maybe it was a Freudian slip that left the bottom row spelling out SOS, because this brand was in desperate need of saving. Months later, the results from this survey question also leaked. It showed hardcore Sens fans wanted the O as the primary mark. Everyone else was just happy with the existing logo. So, in 2020, the team did neither of those things, and simply returned to their original crest. As Ottawa proved, rebrands are hard, and no matter the end result, there are always a lot of ideas that get scrapped. In 2013, the Dallas Star set out for a new look. We saw some of those concepts in an earlier video, but since then, one of those prototypes turned up on eBay. It's a glimpse at what the stars could have looked like using their old colors with the new logos. Going with silver over gold and a much brighter green was definitely the right call. Speaking of a brighter green, check out this jersey. Years before their rebrand, Dallas was reportedly considering a nod to the North Stars event in 2010, a look back at their franchise's origins. They worked with Reebok to develop a design inspired by their old Minnesota threads, but the idea was abandoned before ever making it onto the ice. Here's another prototype jersey that never saw action, created by Pro Player for the Pittsburgh Penguins. This design was being considered as a third jersey ahead of the 2000-2001 season, until the company closed down. When new owners took control of the Mighty Ducks in 2006, they wanted to shed the Disney image and give the team a fresh new Orange County look. They hired New Jersey design firm Frederick & Froberg, now known as Fan Brands. The ideas generated were near limitless, from anatomically accurate mallards to more abstract avian forms. They even tried redrawing the Disney duck with new colors. Perhaps more intriguing was the third jersey exploration, as the designers pitched mostly orange jerseys nearly a decade before the team ever wore one. Speaking of third jerseys, the Columbus Blue Jackets added the Canon design in 2010, but these leaked photos reveal a couple of alternate crest designs. The crossed cannon with the CBJ monogram is one I'd like to see make a comeback someday. In 2007, the San Jose Sharks were among a handful of teams that launched new logos to go with the new Reebok Edge uniforms. A video made for the big reveal showed off a handful of sketches from designer Terry Smith, who's been making logos for the Sharks since the team was founded. Over the last decade, many teams have taken to launching special jerseys to commemorate anniversaries. Just in time for their 50th season, the Buffalo Sabres unveiled this alternate sweater with a bit of gold. But based on this prototype, there could have been a lot more gold. They were probably wise to balance it out. In preparation for their own 50th, the Penguins released this logo in February 2016. Note the three Stanley Cups along the bottom. Four months later, the Pens lifted their fourth cup, and the logo had to be revised. If you're curious about other designs that were considered, check out these sketches from former Penguins designer Dave Shaponik. He also created this logo to commemorate back-to-back -back Stanley Cups in 2017. And here are some of his early drawings. In 2011, the Ottawa Senators collaborated with local artist Jacob Barrett on a new third jersey, what became their heritage jersey. A year later, he came up with this logo for the team's 20th anniversary. Amazing as it is, he admits this design was submitted to the team a little late in the process. So instead, the Sens went with this. This video has been a long one. So, as I close out, I wanted to leave you with a couple of prototype mysteries. In 2020, photos surfaced of a purported Edmonton Oilers sweater, an Adidas jersey not too far off from the real thing, with a few differences. The darker orange and royal blue are the old colors, compared to the brighter orange and navy blue of the current design. Plus, this one has a white collar, 
which reminds me of this prototype leak that happened prior to the Adidas release in 2017. The photo quality is poor, but the colors do seem to match the current look. And to shed a bit more light on the subject, consider this concept art from Euler's uniform designer, Fan Brands. Clearly, the collar was once intended to be white. A closer look at this photo reveals a few more unused concepts, including what looks like oil drops. But back to the mystery jersey. Is this merely a prototype from 2017, or is it something else? I haven't been able to track down any solid answers yet. Likewise, we have this New York Rangers jersey, which turned up on eBay in 2020, and appears to be a prototype from the 2018 Winter Classic. The problem is, the crest doesn't match the jersey we saw on the ice, neither do the collar and stripes. And yet, this doesn't appear to be a mere prototype. It's a breakaway replica with retail tags and Fanatics branding. Getting to that point usually requires clearing many steps of approval. So what exactly are we looking at here? Were there 11th hour changes made to the Rangers Winter Classic sweater after a few replicas made it through the factory? For now, that's all I've got. The end of a three-parter on NHL prototypes. Will there be more to come? I hope so. I'd love to see more unused concepts come to light. As always, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like this video before you go and subscribe for more. And please consider showing your support for this channel with a super thanks or PayPal donation. Your kindness is appreciated more than you know. That's all for now. See you next time.